God. And we just pray your hand to be upon it, um, Father God. We pray that we would just have a sweet time of fellowship. We pray that nobody would get injured today, Father, and that everybody would just have a good time uh, rejoicing in what you've done for us, Father God. We thank you for that. And Father, we ask that you would be with uh, Cody as he leads us in uh, worship this morning, Father God. I pray that you would keep his uh, voice strong and his guitar tuned. We thank you for that, Father. And we pray for Pastor as he leads us into your word this morning, Father, that he would do it with boldness. Uh, with clarity, Father God, and I pray for the word to just go forth and accomplish everything that you have set it forth to accomplish. I pray that you would cultivate in our hearts right now a uh, good soil, Father God, that that uh, the seed that's going to be sown this morning would take root in our hearts, Father God, and that we may become more like your son, Jesus. Father, we just love you, we thank you, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs>
your time. Child of weakness 
this watching rain, finding me thy morning. Is Jesus paid it all? Oh, to him I am. Sin and left a crimson stain. Burning my burdens in fields of grace. 
Romans that God demonstrated His love towards us that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus says that there's no greater love than this than for a man to lay down his life for a friend. And that's exactly what Jesus did for you and for me. Is He gave Himself an offering, made Himself a sacrifice for us that He would take our place and to pay our debt and He willingly went to the cross to, to bear the penalty that you and I deserve upon Himself. Jesus took it, and He took it to the grave, and He and He has cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. And you know, today is our day where we celebrate or we take of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of that truth of Jesus' broken body for us and and His shed blood for us. And Jesus says that we are to do this in remembrance of Him. So today we are doing this in remembrance of what Christ did for us. And I know that most of y'all know the routine, but I'm going to go ahead and repeat it again. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, I'm going to have you come start from the front of the row, uh, from the inside, come forward, take the sacraments, and then from the front to the back, work your way then and back around to the outside of the road, back to your seats, okay? Let's bow our heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, God, just for the gift of Christ, Lord. Thank you. God, for His willingness to step in and take our place, Lord, to pay our debt, Lord. Father, we know that it's by His stripes that we are healed, Father. Jesus paid the debt for us. He paid the ultimate price, Lord, for us. He gave His life for us, Lord, as, as our substitute, Lord. Thank you. God, we are thankful, Lord, for the gift of grace and, and eternal life that we find through that truth, that reality. We know, God, that none of us, none of us are counted worthy Lord, of what we have received, Lord. Your grace is sufficient for us, God. Grace is what has redeemed us and saved us, Lord. Thank you. And we just pray, God, that you would just continue to, to show yourself more and more to us, Lord, as we seek you in all things, God. I pray, Lord, that today as we take of this communion, as of this Lord's Supper, Lord, that we would be in remembrance, Lord, of what it cost you, Lord. It cost you your son, Lord. And I pray, Lord, God, that we, as we take of this bread, that we would do it in remembrance of Jesus' body, His pierced body that was pierced for us, Lord, and, and His shed blood that was spilt out on Calvary, Lord, God, uh, Lord, and let that be a reminder to us today, Lord, uh, just of how much You loved us, Lord. Your Word tells us in 1 John, it's not that we love You, but that You first loved us and You gave Your Son to be the propitiation for our sins, Lord. Father, we give you all praise, honor, and glory this morning because you alone are worthy. We thank you, God, for your continued faithfulness and provision for every need. We know that you are our provider. We just pray, Lord, that you would bless the offering here today. God, that you would grow it, multiply it, and use it, God, for your purpose, your glory, your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we take of this bread this morning, we do it in remembrance of the body that was broken for us. Take and eat. As we take this juice, we do it in remembrance of the blood that was shed for us. Take a drink. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you God, just for Jesus and his sacrifice, Lord. God, for, the, for to be reconciled with you, Lord, where we were once separated from you, God. Jesus has brought us near to you, Lord, through his shed blood, through his broken body, Lord. Thank you. God, we love you. Uh, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So how are we this morning, church? Y'all doing okay? Y'all survived the storm last night? I slept right through it. You and I both. I know. Uh, but I've had everybody tell me how bad it was. I said I wouldn't know. Because <laughs> I slept right through it. Uh, actually, I woke up about 2 o'clock and I heard a little bit of thunder. And, but that was it. You know, it wasn't anything severe, it didn't sound like to me. But apparently we got a pretty good storm last night. All right, so listen, we are starting a new series today. Uh, it's going to be quite a bit shorter than our series in the book of Nehemiah. Um, we're going to be, this is more topical than it is as far as uh, going through a book in the Bible. We're going to be looking at several different passages uh, through this process, but primarily three. And we'll probably be touching on those back and forth uh, during this process. Uh, but we're going to, in fact, if you want to go ahead and turn there, that way you're ready for it. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. If you 
You let me know when you find that, mark that. Of course, it'll be up on the screen as well, I think. Nobody's up there to man the computer, so I'm not sure. <laughs> First Peter 2, beginning with verse 9. And secondly, we're going to be over in 1 Corinthians 12. Am I going too fast for you? Just let me know. Tell me to slow down if I need to. Okay. 1 Corinthians 12. Yeah, beginning with verse 12. And where we're going to be spending the bulk of our time uh, is in Hebrews 10. Uh, looking at verses 24 and 25, we touched on that very briefly last week, and I just want to kind of dig in a little deeper uh, to the context of that, because the, the series that we're going to be starting on is, is about the church, okay? Uh, what is the church? We are. What is the purpose of the church? All right, and what's our involvement in the church? Uh, just really digging in and seeing what that looks like, right, as it's fleshed out, all right, as it's lived out, okay? Uh, you know, first of all, I, I want to make me mention that Jesus... That God builds the church, man doesn't. Okay, uh, you know Jesus speaking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 says, "Upon this rock I will build my church." He says, "And even the gates of hell will not prevail against it." We see that it's God, it's Jesus who builds the church, not man. Uh, it's not, it doesn't mean that we're not involved in that process, but ultimately, God builds the church. Okay, but what is the church? If you were to look up the word church uh, in, in a concordance, Strong's concordance per se, and you looked up what church was and, and what, what the, uh, the Greek word was, was used there, uh, it, it's the word ekklesia, and it means called out assembly. Okay, That's what the word means, is called out assembly. So the, the idea, if you separate those two, uh, just for a moment, and you look at called out, that's something that has been brought out of some something. And assembling is someone is, is a gathering, a, a calling to something. And that's ultimately what we're going to be kind of journeying through is this idea that the church is, to, is called out, okay, and it's called to. And we're going to see very clearly that the church isn't a location, all right? It's not a structure. It's not a building. The church is a people. We see that identified really clearly in Second uh, in First Corinthians chapter twelve, which we'll get there shortly. But first of all, we are called out. Okay, the church, the body of Christ, is made up of believers. We are the church. We are the body of Christ, and the church is is the people, right? God's people, God's children, joined and united together. It's not it's not a denomination. Okay, it's not. An organization, necessarily, it's a people. And, and that's what we're going to see kind of as we journey through this. But I want to begin by looking at 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'll tell you what, before we do that, let's take a moment to bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to be here this, evening, uh, this morning, Lord. God, thank you for your presence that is here with us, Father. We understand and know, God, that we're two or three gathered, gathered in your name. There you are in the midst, Father. And uh, Father, we know that apart from you, we can do nothing, Lord. Uh, God, without your Holy Spirit teaching us and leading us, Father God, uh, Father, we would be lost. So, Father, we pray, Lord, God, that your Holy Spirit, God, would lead us into all truth, Lord. Teach us tonight, this morning, Father. Uh, God, I pray, Lord, that you would just take away from us any distraction that we might have brought with us into these doors this morning, Lord, from this uh, past week or even this morning, Lord. We just pray, God, that you would just move that out of the way. Lord, that we might be in such a place, Lord God, where we could just truly just sit still and listen to you speak to us, Lord. Uh, Father, I pray for myself, God, that you would just set me aside and use me as your vessel, Lord. Uh, Father, help me to share this word that you um, that you put on my heart, Lord. I pray every word that's spoken would bring honor and glory to your holy name. My day is our purpose here tonight, this morning, Father, and that it would edify and build up um, your body, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here the Apostle Paul, I mean Peter, um, in verse 9, says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness 
into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And in this passage of, of, of Scripture that we read here, first of all, we see that we are a chosen people. Right? That God chose us. That we, are, that we are a holy nation. That we are His own special people. That God reached down and He chose and picked you and I for His, for His glory. And, and we understand and know that, you know, like <clears throat> the Bible tells us that it's not that we love God, right? But that God first loved us and gave Himself as, a, as His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. That God first loved us. Okay? We are His chosen people. People. We're His own special people. We have been chosen by God. And church, we also see in this that we have been set apart. We've been set apart from darkness and we've been brought into light, right? And we also see that, that, that we were with those who had once not have, had, had or those who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy, right? The calling out, okay? The being set apart. God has set us apart for Himself. And, you know, how do we get there? Well, it's through the power of God, through the provision of God through Christ Jesus. And that's how we become children of God. We are adopted, grafted into the family of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I was reminded of, um, of Colossians when I was studying this and reading over this. And in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14, you can jot that down. I didn't put it up here on the screen because I just want to make mention of it. But Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14 says this. It says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And it's interesting to me, but if you take that word uh, conveyed, it means to be transported. Alright? It's kind of like you're watching Star Trek, right? And they're about to travel to another planet. And, and they, they go to that special room and they hit that button and all of a sudden, man, they're vaporized. They disappear, right? And then automatically, all, all of a sudden, they just show up in another place, in another location, right? And the same thing is, is, is being spoken of us whenever we are called out of darkness and we are called into light. Is that God conveys us. He transports us from where we were in one place. All of a sudden, we're not there anymore. All of a sudden, we're in a new location. It's, 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 a, it's a conveying, it's a transportation where God takes us, miraculous takes us from one place and puts us in another. Where we were once children of wrath, now we're counted children of God. Okay? And it's, and it's instant. The moment, the moment of our confession of faith, when we place faith in Christ and His provision through His death, His burial, and His, and His resurrection, church, in that moment, we are conveyed into the kingdom of God. We are called out. But what are we called out from? Well, darkness and light, but church from the world. Okay, the Bible tells us in 1 John that, that we can't love the world and the things in it. Because, listen, because we're not of the world. Our identity is not found there. That's not who we are anymore. We are a new creature in Christ. We've been taken from that place and we have been conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That's our identity. That's where we're found. Amen. That is our home. That's where we belong. Now that church, that doesn't mean that we can't, we're not to be in the world. Obviously we have to be in the world. But we're not to be of the world. In other words, church, we're not to adopt its patterns or its culture or its ideas. Church, if it's in opposition to what God's Word said. Now you know I stress the importance of, right, of the Bible, God's Word being our foundation. Like, you know, everything stems off of what God says and has said and continues to say. It is written. Okay? It's in God's Word. That's where we find our foundation. And everything else, the Bible tells us, let man be a liar, uh, let God be true, and every man a liar. <laughs> and in church, we stand on that truth, that firm foundation, because we don't belong to this world. We've been conveyed from there. We've been chosen. We have been called out. We have been set apart for God. And in church, that's, that happens because we have placed faith and hope and trust in Christ and Christ alone. Not because of sheer willpower or determination. or It's solely because of the work of God through His Son, Christ Jesus, and His sacrifice for us. And, and, and we become new. We're not the same as we once were. Now church, there's some things 
that we will struggle with. There are, no, I'm not putting it that way. I don't mean it that way. I, it doesn't just all disappear and you become the sinless, sinless perfect creature the moment that you place faith in Christ. The Bible is very clear that we're justified once at the point of our confession. When we confess Jesus Christ, and justifying mean, justification means that we are that we can stand before God and we're forgiven of our sins. That, that happens the moment that we confess Jesus Christ. But there's a process of sanctification that begins at the point of your conversion all the way to the point of your glorification. When you're brought to be with the Lord eternally, we are being sanctified, set apart for God. God is continuing that, that process of, 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 of transforming us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, as we die a little bit more to that old man and we become more like Christ Jesus through the process of sanctification. But church, we are the body. We are the church. All right. When we talk about church, we're not talking about a building or a structure. We're talking about the body of Christ, those, those who the called out those who have been called out of this world and, and, and brought to assemble together. Okay? And I want us to, to look at those two, um, those two ideas, what it is to be called out. All right? We are called out, separated, and set apart for God. But church, we're set apart for God for purpose. And it's a community thing. It's not an individual thing. We, it, it, we're we're going to see that, that we are the body of Christ. If you want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 for a moment. And we're really going to spend the bulk of our time in Hebrews chapter 10. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 12, Paul writes, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and now all have been made to drink into to one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And then in verse 25, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. You see, the body is, there's one body, right? But the body has many members, right? Uh, you know, we have one body, but I mean, the, the, we, we have fingers, we have toes. Those are separate from one another. All right, we have arms, we have legs. I mean, it's all part of the same body, but they all have different functions. They they do different things. And you know, if, if you go through, and we'll look at this kind of as we go through this, is that going through chapter twelve, you would see that if one part of that body is out of function, if it's out of order, if something's wrong with one part of that body, it affects the whole body. All right, and I want us to remember. I mean, he says here. In verse 25, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. We are members together, jointly, corporately, but we're also individuals. And each individual needs attention. Like, we need to be concerned about one another. That's, that's the reality of it, is that if we're one body, church, we're being, we're being guided by one head, and Jesus is the head. And if we're all following and seeking and obeying God, if we're looking to be used of God, then God works through His body in order to work and get amongst the individuals to, to help lift them up, to strengthen them, and, and to grow them. And that really brings us to Hebrews chapter 10, which, I, like I said, I want to spend the bulk of our time this morning. We touched on this, like I said briefly last week, about the importance of assembling together. Uh, but why? Why is it so important that we assemble together? I did a, um, a word study on these two verses, 24, 24 and 25 of chapter 10 of Hebrews, meaning that, you know, I just sat and I picked, a, picked it apart. I looked at every, every word in there and I compared it to, the, I brought it to the Strong's Concordance and I wanted to know, you know, what is it? meaning context. What does this truly mean? And, and the only way to truly do that church is, is, to, is to go back to the original kind of writings, okay? Go back to the Greek as this is the New Testament. Go back and see what was it meant to say when it was said, okay? And that's important. And I want to bring that out as we kind of go through this. I want to read to you these two verses and then we're going to come back and kind of touch on some things here this morning. But in verse 24, it says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. First of all, the writer of Hebrews says that we're to consider one another. What does that mean? Well, the Greek word there, what it means is to behold, perceive, or discover. Okay? I want, to, I want us to look at those just for a moment. What does it mean to consider? Well, the biblical usage of that word is to examine closely. What does it mean to behold? Well, it means to call attention to what may, uh, what may be seen or heard. Perceive? The ability to see beneath the outward form to the underlying, often hidden reality. Discover to get first sight or knowledge of. Sounds to me like it's more than just being in acquaintance with somebody, right? I mean, we're talking about the body of Christ. We're talking about the, about the considering of one another, you and I together, corporately. Like it's a close and personal examination. Like you get to know the person. You don't just treat them as casual. You, you treat them, listen, in reality, when we are joined together by faith in Jesus Christ, you and I become family. It's a personal thing. Like you and I, church, we're more than just acquaintances. We are joined together by Christ and we are in the same family together. And to consider one another, and I love what, I, what it states here about what it means to perceive, is the ability to see beneath the outward form to the underlying, often hidden reality, right? It's like you... You don't you get you you don't just see a, 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 the surface of the person, but you see that there's something deeper on a deeper level. Like it's through examining, like you're paying attention. You're not just you know coming on a Sunday morning and you're and you're shaking a hand and and then you forget about that person all week long and all of a sudden you know you you come back to church on Sunday and, and it's the same thing repeatedly over and over again. Like. You know, true fellowship, the way the church works in unity with one another, the way that we're strengthened, the way that we edify one another is through relationship. Getting to know one another. Being willing to look past the surface and understand there may be a deeper underlying issue. And church, that doesn't mean that you just go and confront somebody about it. But listen, you ought to be able to examine the person to this extent where you know there's something they're struggling with and immediately you can bow your head and you can go to the Lord in prayer on their behalf. That is done by careful examination, by, by consideration, being considered, uh, considerate of our brother. I, I want to ask you a question. How well do you know the person sitting across the aisle from you? Yeah. Listen, listen, I'm... This isn't a message to, you know, to discourage us. It's a message to instruct us, to, to show us the need for that, right? The need for intimate fellowship, getting to know one another. I, you know, to be a strong body, it's through relationship, it's through fellowship. You think about the relationship between Christ and the church and how, how, Jesus, how Paul paints that picture uh, in, in, uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 5 when he compares that relationship to a, to a marriage, right? Paul, speaking to the husband, speaking to the wife, he says, Wives, submit yourselves to, the husbands, to your husbands just as unto the Lord. Right? And he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. But then later on he says, I speak to you a great mystery, but I speak to you concerning Christ and his church. You see, we are strengthened when we are strengthened in the Lord. The church, we are also strengthened when we, are, when we come alongside one another and we consider one another. But he says we're to consider one another. But then he says consider one, one another in, in order to stir up love and good works. Now, the word love there is, is, is the Greek word agape. It is the highest form of love. It's, it's more than just, you know, I told you this before. I love ice cream. Anybody else here love ice cream? There's a lot of things that I say, man, I love. But it's a different kind of love. Whenever you look at the Greek, okay, there's different, there's different words used to describe particular types of love. The, the word love here, the agape love, is to, used to describe 
a, a sacrificial, unconditional. It's a, it's a, it's a deep love. And he said, and you know, the writer of Hebrews is saying that we're to spur one another on, stir one another up. And that word stir literally means, church, that we are to entice one another to good things, entice one another to love, like encourage one another to love. That we would love one another in, in that way. In the way that, listen, it's beyond, just, it's, 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 a, it's not a selfish focus, it's not a focus on self, it's a focus on others. And when you look at the way that God loved us, right, He focused on us. To the point where he was willing to sacrifice his son in order that he might redeem us when we had fallen, when we had because of sin. I mean, God sent his son that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for you and I. Like to stir one another, encourage one another up to love and also good works. And the word there works uh, means that it's talking about deeds or labor, but it's talking about good works, right? The Bible is specifically clear, listen, that we're not saved by our works, but we are saved unto good works. And church, you and I have been called to a purpose, a plan of God, to be used of God. He has a purpose for each and every one of us here this morning. And we're going to look at that later on going through 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Listen, there, there's a purpose for each and every part of the body. And it's a very important role. There's no one part of that role that is less important than the other part of the body. They're all equally important. And they're all meant for the purpose of edifying the church, edifying the body, strengthening the body. We have a responsibility in this. We have a purpose in this. God has called us out and called Him to Himself for the purpose, church, of going out, for being a part of the body of Christ and edifying one another, strengthening one another, lifting one another up. But then he would go on to say in verse 25, right, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, I looked up for what forsaking means and it says, God forbid. God forbid that we forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Because God's purpose for the church is that we gather. We gather in community. We gather together. All right, we um, listen. I'm talk, trying to come down. This isn't so much for those who who don't show up to church on a regular basis. It's more for those who do. All right, what is our purpose? Why? Why? Why do we gather? What? Is, what is the meaning behind it? It's to edify one another. It's to stir one another on to love and good works. But church, we can't do that if we're sa we're forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. This is where it happens. This is where discipleship is done. This is where encouragement comes from in order that we might face the week ahead of us, right? In order that we might uh, encourage one another on to love and good work, stirring one another up. We all have a purpose here. It's not put on one person. This is a corporate thing. It's the body of Christ working together for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God. We're not, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But the Strong's there, it, it, with looking at assembling together, it means a gathering together in one place. Right? Corporately coming together. That's what we do here on a Sunday morning. All right? And on Wednesday nights, we come together as the body of Christ, assembling together for this purpose, to stir one another on to love and good works. We... We need one another. And church, how well you know the person sitting across the aisle from you, ultimately that responsibility falls on you. You can't blame it on the other person. How, how dedicated are you to getting to know one another? How involved are you? What's your participation look like? Because church, it happens in fellowship. The getting to know one another is, is, is it happens through more time spent with one another. That's how we grow in relationships and fellowship with one another. But we're not to forsake the assembly to ourselves together. But then he says, right, uh, uh, for the purpose of exhorting one another. And that means to beseech or comfort or exhort, desire, pray, entreat. I wrote down here, beseeches, call upon, appeal, or beg. Comfort means to encourage, 
Exhort means a form of communication that is used to persuade or encourage someone to take action or to continue doing something according to God's truth. Listen, this is not this this walk of faith is not an easy walk. Life is hard. And life comes against you. And, and listen, there's an enemy, a very real enemy out there who desires nothing more but to discourage you. Right? To, to knock you down and to keep you down. And it's the purpose of the church to come alongside to encourage one another. Because church, we cannot do it alone. We need community. We need... the. The brothers and sisters in Christ who are willing to come alongside and lift you up. And can I tell you, I know some personal stories amongst many of you here this morning. And I know that there are struggles and things that you're going through that are too heavy for you to carry. And I, church, I want to encourage the church, the body of Christ here to say, you know what, I'm going to pray for them. You know what, I'm going to do my part to encourage them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be more considerate of their, of their situation and their needs, and I, and I'm gonna be more attentive to them. I'm gonna pay attention. I'm not gonna be so self-focused that I'm gonna take my eyes off the reality that there's, this is a community. This is a, this is, this is the body of Christ working together and working out this walk of faith together. Are you with me? Amen. You hear me this morning, church? Amen. And God loved us enough to send His Son Christ Jesus to die for us when we were unworthy. We did not deserve it. He gave His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He has called us as followers of Jesus Christ, as the body of Christ, to community, to work together, to be unified. That's what the church is. The church is not a structure, it's a people. It is a people, and we're called to one headship, Jesus Christ. And church, you listen, when you understand and realize, right, the, the, the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and I, listen, there ought to be a heart's desire to follow and obey God, whatever the cost. That's truly what it means to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. That we would offer ourselves into service to Him, not because it's commanded of us, but because there's a deep desire, just because out of appreciation of what He has done for you and I. Church, I want you to know that I love you. I would not be doing what I do if I didn't love you. You hear my heart in that. I can tell you. After 10 plus years of being dedicated to this church, it is not always easy. I'm a man just like anybody else, and times get hard. But I am in this, and I'm in it to the end. I'm not going to walk away from it. You know why? Because God has given me a love for you, a compassion for you, a desire to see you grow and to be discipled and to become. All that God wants you to be, I am in it. And you know why? Because He first loved me. Amen. And church, we are in this together. And if you want to see God move, listen, I, I've never been, I've never been this, this preacher that is just worried about building numbers. I'm not, I'm not, the kind of pastor that just wants to see this place filled and all the seats taken up. I would love that. But I'm not, that's not my focus. My focus is to disciple. To, to, to help you grow and at the same time, I'm growing with you. But to help you grow in your faith and your knowledge and your understanding of the Lord and, and who we are in Him. That's my heart's desire. Can I tell you, church, when the body is healthy, natural growth happens. Sometimes, church, we got to look back and we got to look in. And we have to take close examination of ourselves and we have to admit listen, it's okay to be weak because in our, in our, in our weakness, his strengths are made perfect. Just rely and depend on him. 
God, God wants Lifehouse Church, or Bible Church, to be a healthy church. A healthy body joined together, working together corporately, not individually. Like, we all have our individual callings, and not everyone is the same, but they're all of equal importance. But when those callings are in working together corporately, man, great things can happen. There has to be a willingness on our part to surrender and obey. Listen, we're not against one another. That's not what this is about. We're, we're in this together. That's what the church is. We are the called out assembly of God. Called out of this world and conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of His love. We are, we are, we are brothers and sisters in Christ joined to one headship, Jesus Christ. One. And he unites us. And the more that we surrender to Him, church, the stronger we get in relationship to one another. Would you please stand this morning? Listen, there's a God in heaven. You know what? I've told you my testimony before. I grew up with the knowledge of God. My parents instilled that in me. What I didn't know was that that God was more than just some far off distant creature out there, you know, who, who just was waiting for me to mess up and slam his hammer down, you know. It wasn't until, the, until, the, until that moment when I realized that God wanted, he was, he was real. It wasn't just this far off distant creature, he is God and he is, he's just as real as you and I sitting here and he desires fellowship with us. He wants us to know Him. And if we make it about anything else, we've taken away from the power of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus died so that He could reconcile us to the Father. He has entered behind the veil, tearing it from top to bottom, and He has made a way that you and I can boldly approach the throne of grace and that we might find help in our time of need. Jesus has made a way so that we can know Him intimately, church. And listen, the more, the closer we get to know Him, the stronger we get, we, we come in, in relationship to one another. So let us draw near to Him this morning. No? Draw near to Him. Just seek His face. Know that he, he loves you and that He wants an intimate, personal, close relationship with you. And that goes beyond any circumstance, church. It's not, there's nothing, Paul, Paul says in Romans 8 that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Paul says, I'm convinced of this, church. Are you? Are you convinced of that this morning? Nothing changes God's love because God is love. God can never go against His nature because He is God. Let us, let us look like the church. Let's follow our head, Jesus Christ, and let's walk in faithfulness and obedience to God, and let's serve one another. We are the body. Invitations open as Cody plays to this song. Would you please come?